as we get started, I will pray, and then we will just believe, because we really... Really what we need is not just uh, me blathering on what we need. We actually believe that the Lord would say something. We believe that God would uh, breathe upon his word in a way that just causes life on the inside. And so uh, that's just the importance of, uh, of praying in this way. So, Lord, we do come tonight, and we are thankful to come to you. We are thankful that you have invited us around your table, that we can gather uh, around your table and, and just feed our, our souls on you. And Lord, we ask that the living word, the, the scriptures would, would just, now that you would use those scriptures in a way that gives us the words of life. We say again, Jesus, uh, as it was said so long ago, that you alone have the words of eternal life. God, thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that you would just have uh, full access to our hearts uh, as well as our minds. Like, we can speak to the mind, but Lord, only you are able to really uh, touch the heart. And so we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is, as I said, week three of Advent. Uh, hard to believe, but uh, you can tell because there's three candles that were lit, so we're definitely in week three. And uh, we've been kind of working through uh, a little bit of a series here called Embracing Hope, uh, really intentionally each week focusing on the person of Jesus Christ because our hope is not found in uh, different circumstances or in different financial situations or anything like that. Our hope is truly found living and active in Jesus Christ. And so what I have desired to do for these weeks, uh, again in, and again tonight, is to really focus our hearts and our minds around Jesus Christ and who He is. Uh, and so we looked uh, at a few things, and, and we started last week uh, talking about uh, how Jesus is the, he is the fulfillment of three major offices. I, I talked about the threefold office last week as a, as a term that may be new to some of you, threefold office, that he is, he is prophet, priest, and king, all three simultaneously, one person rap, in, embodying all three of those, which, would, which to uh, the Old Testament era would have been unthinkable that one person could have done that, but here Jesus is. And so last week we looked at Jesus uh, as the prophet, this week we're going to look at Jesus as our high, as our high priest, as was read so excellently by Micah and Lauren. Uh, just really grateful for their reading of the uh, of the scriptures tonight. So we're going to look at we're going to look at that, and uh, and what I want to do is sort of again, uh, I I sent a text message to Jonathan, and I said, is it possible to have too much scripture, uh, too many scripture verses in a in a message? And uh, he, he ignored the text message. He, he ghosted me. <laughs> Didn't respond at all, but I'm getting used to that. Um, anyways, I'm just having fun. Anyways, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to really look up primarily at the book of Hebrews, uh, which is Stephen's current favorite book of the scriptures. Uh, he's been sort of really immersing himself, I think for months now, actually, in the book of Hebrews. And so uh, he'll be su- certainly familiar with, uh, with the verses that we're going to look at. Because the book of Hebrews, in a really unique way, actually talks quite a lot about, uh, the, it doesn't say explicitly the threefold office, but so much of the, the prophet, the priest, and the king uh, is found embod- written about in the book of Hebrews. And really, really dynamically, uh, Jesus as our great high priest. Uh, that is explicit, that is, is, is fully, fully developed uh, by the author of Hebrews. And so, uh, one of the things, I'll just read, I've got so many scriptures uh, written down here, and I'll just give them to you if you're a note taker, uh, you can write them down. If, if not, uh, Mark is recording this, and so there will be a recording uh, of, of, this, uh, of this message, if, you, if anybody was interested in looking back and going, what was that verse again? And, but it's, it's amazing. So, one, there's three major things that the, the priest in the Old Testament had three major aspects or, or roles or duties that he would perform. And the first one of them was that the priest was the one that would offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. And so it, this is developed in, in, in Hebrews 10, where it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never actually take away sins. But when this priest had offered uh, for all time one sacrifice, so speaking of Jesus, 
When this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, And so there's this thing that says that in the Old Testament era, there were priests and they had to continually, you know, slaughter the animal and offer the sacrifice in order to make some atonement. And it was a very limited atonement because it had to be done over and over and over and over and over again. And so it became this, it was very much a ritual uh, for the Jewish people that was, that was prescribed for them. And the Lord said, for this temporary time, you, this is what you need to do. Uh, in, and so they would do this over and over again. Because it, but what happened was, is that it was always in God's heart that, he would, that Jesus was going to come and give of himself, that more than him sacrificing an animal and the animal's life, that Jesus would come and sacrifice his own life. And that it would not be just the, the blood of an animal, it would, be, it would be his own blood that would be spilled for the forgiveness of sins. And that this would be a once and for all thing, that it would never have to be repeated again. And this is the, this is the power of it. So it says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, the author says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one, that one being in heaven, But no, he entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way that the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all, at the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So again, this is the scriptural basis for what I just said, that in the Old Testament times there was this continual need, but then Jesus comes and he doesn't go into a a temple that's made by human hands. He goes into the temple that is spiritually the temple in heaven because the temple that was on earth is representative of what exists in heaven. And he would come and he would come into that place, spiritually speaking, uh, and really offer himself, and he really offer himself uh, on behalf of all the people. So the first thing that the priest did was to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. The second thing that the priests were always, the Old Testament priests would always do, would they would they would bring they would bring the people, they would represent the people before God. And so you know that many of you would be familiar about how in the Old Testament there was the high priest and once a year he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would go in there and he'd have like this, you know, have this little bell and this rope and all of this kind of thing in, in case he died and uh, there was a problem, they'd be able to deal with it uh, and stuff. It was very, very intense, but there he is. So he was able to go in. But when they would go into the temple and he would go into the Holy of Holies, one of the things that he was doing was he was actually representing the people. He was a representative on behalf of all of these other people in terms of uh, bringing the people, representing the people in God's presence. And here we have Jesus as the one who, uh, who comes and represents us before God. I mean, it's a, it's honestly, it's a staggering thing. One of the things that I've actually never really, I haven't really paid uh, a ton of, of uh, attention to is the whole, is the doctrine of the ascension. Now, the doctrine of the ascension is basically the doctrine about how Jesus, he, he's raised from the dead, he appears for a period of time to the disciples, and then he ascends to, he ascends back to heaven. And this is actually very important in, in the book of Hebrews, about the fact that he ascended to God, and he stands at the right hand of, or he's seated at the right hand of God, but he represents the people in God's presence. So in this It's not only that Jesus came and offered himself as a sacrifice on our behalf, but he continually represents us in God's presence. And this is honestly a very, very profound thing. I think the representation is a little bit foreign to us uh, because we don't really think about it in terms of particularly us as, uh, you know, Protestant Christians, primarily Protestant Christians, who just, we just don't necessarily think in those terms that we would need somebody that would represent us. But this was the role of the, this was the, a very, very important role uh, that, the, that the high priest had in the Old Testament era and is one that was really, really dynamic and that Jesus continues to fulfill. Now, this is, a, this is such an awesome verse in Hebrews 6, in verses 17 and, and to 20. It says, so when God desired... So when God desired to show more convincingly to the hearts of 
To the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have, I love this phrase, we, have, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. I love that phrase, that we have this hope that we hold fast to. And then it says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's a lot of stuff in there uh, and whatnot, and whatnot, but I did want to bring that out just uh, as a recommendation to Greg Christensen regarding the role of the forerunner. In, in the book of Hebrews, there he is. There. Glad you're here for that. But this reality that Jesus ascends, so he goes behind the veil, he goes behind the curtain, and he, it's all broken through, the, through his uh, death and resurrection on the cross. But here's Jesus going in there as a representation, as a representative on our behalf. And I just think it's tremendously significant. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus right now is seated in heaven beside God as a representative of, of you. Like, not a someone else, but of actually of you and I and all of us, that we're actually represented in his presence. And, and the significance of that is something that, that is intended to give us tremendous hope. I mean, listen to what it says. That we might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. For we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. And I just wanna, I wanted to really emphasize that because this whole series is about embracing hope. And I love the fact that Carlotta, as she's been praying about hope each week, has been praying for those who, you know, hope has been put in the, in, into the drawer, as she said. That there's people that, you know, and just that's the reality of, of life, is sometimes you just sort of, you're going through life and it's hard and it's brutal and you're not even aware of the fact that you've taken hope of things ever changing or ever being better or ever improving and you've, you've subtly, unknowingly taken it and put it into a drawer and you've tucked it away. And I love the fact that, I mean, Carlotta and I didn't even touch, touch uh, base on this beforehand, but the Lord would call us to, to open up that drawer and take hope again, to take hold of hope, to embrace hope, to, believe, to dare to believe yet again that there is, there is a God in heaven who sees, that there is a God in heaven who speaks, and as we're going to develop, that he also prays for us on our behalf. So these scriptures are very, yes, they're very dense and theological, and there's a guy named Melchizedek, and it, it just sounds weird. And one, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about Melchizedek right now. Worry about, think about this, that God is calling you to open up the drawer and to take hope out again and to believe, to believe again, to dare to believe that tomorrow can be better than last week, that this week coming can be better than last week. And I'm, I'm truly not being sort of a raw, raw cheerleader right now. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm incapable of that. And so, but the reality is that in, in God, we have this hope that is an anchor for the soul. Like God, I just, I just want to pause right now, Lord, and just ask Lord, we need that anchor, in, an anchor for our soul because we're being tossed about in these days. We are being tossed about to and fro in so many ways and in so many areas. And I believe, Lord, tonight that spiritually that you would provide us a hope that is an anchor, an anchor for us, an anchor for our souls. And we say, Jesus, that we look to you. We look to you as our source of hope. Amen. All right, the next thing that I want to focus on in, and just really kind of develop even a little bit more is the, is the third role that the priest had. So the priest would be the one that offered sacrifice. The priest would be the one that represented the people before God. But the third one is one that really, really pumps me up. And it's the fact that the priest would be one who interceded, prayed for, interceded for the people. That was, the, that was one of the roles of the priest that he would do. And the way in which Jesus is the, is the God who intercedes. He is the God who prays for you. 
is a very deep and profound reality. And I want to look at this uh, together for a few minutes. Uh, Hebrews 7.25 makes this really, really explicitly clear. Therefore, he, speaking of Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Just like allow that to kind of think, to just pause and think about that. The idea that, the idea that Jesus always lives to intercede. Now, I did a little bit of kind of, not kind of the study that Stephen's doing, but just a little bit of study into this. Because a lot of times you think, well, Jesus, Jesus certainly did that on the cross. That, it, that through his act of crucifixion on the cross and being raised up, that it's through that act that, he, that, that that's what this is referring to. But according to what I've been you know, looking into, uh, the, the Greek that's written in, in Hebrews does indicate more of a, more of a request, a petition, uh, like a pr- the way that we would think of prayers and asking for things, asking God for something. And so this is a monumental, it's, to me it's very mysterious. I, I, I'm not going to go into, I just think it's very, very, it's something, it's just hard to really delve into how significant it is and the way in which Jesus actually prays for you and he prays for me and for us. Romans, uh, Paul in Romans 8 says very much the same thing. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So both, uh, both the author of Hebrews and, the, uh, and Paul, I'm differentiating between those two for anybody who's really conservative, most scholars, 99% of scholars understand that the book of Hebrews was not written by Paul. Just like to correct that. Anyways, but that's not my point. My point is that Jesus is interceding for us and is, uh, I just get distracted by those things. But anyways, but here, here's this thing. And now I'm going to look at the verse that, uh, that Micah and Lauren read for us. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended whoop, into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet did not sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, Honestly, that I... I really, I just found this verse, I found so much life in this verse again this week uh, in particular. As I thought about the fact that, first of all, it says that Jesus ascended, that, that he's in heaven, that he's, he's representing me before God. He's representing us before God, like right now. And he's, he's there in that, in that way. And he's interceding, he's, he's praying, and, and not just like interceding for you and for me implies something that I think is really significant, and it's this. In order to to really effectively intercede for somebody, you have to know them, and you have to know their needs, and you have to, you, you know, like, it's good, I can pray for, like, the masses of people, and we can pray for the country, and we can pray for that, but when you actually pray for a person to be able to say, you know, Father, I come and I bring so-and-so and I, I'm praying for, for them. And I ask, O oh Lord, for this and for that need that you know that they have. Like the, the, the truth of the, the fact that Jesus is interceding for you, it means that, and I mean, again, we say this, but just let it hit your spirit. Let it, let it go a little deeper. He actually knows how to, to pray for you because he knows you that well. He knows what is going on in your life. It's not hidden from him. And so his intercession is, is personal. His, inter, his intercession is, is so profound. Uh, just, and I, I just want to encourage you to, to meditate on that. And, when I, and all that simply means is, I mean, there's different ways of doing it, but what I'm talking about right now is just, just sit down sometime in the next few days or you know, maybe tonight or whatever and just like, Lord you, Jesus, you're interceding. For me, you can even just read that verse. You know that he lives forever to to intercede. Uh, that he's praying for us, and so Jesus, who has ascended, 
the doctrine of the ascension. He's ascended. He's in heaven. Uh, and so that's what the first thing that that verse really con- conveys. But then there's another thing that goes on that it, that it says that I think is, is tremendously uh, worth our attention. And it's that Jesus sympathizes with our weakness. He understands what we're going through. And I know I've said that, but he sympathizes with our weakness. I think that we, all of us, are fairly in touch with our, our frailty, our weakness, our inabilities, where we're falling short. Uh, if you're anything like me, you know, you can be, we can be our own worst critic, uh, you know, fairly hard on ourselves and understanding the weaknesses that we have and feeling inadequate and feeling all of those things. And the reality is, is that Jesus sympathizes with our weakness. It's, it's just right there that he understands. So a lot of times you, we can get into this space we can get into this thing where like, you know, my wife Pam knows that I've had times like this in, in my own life where I'm like, nobody understands. They just, they just don't understand. They just, I just, it, what I, who I am and what I'm going through, like nobody understands. I'm just, you know, and, and everything. And sometimes that can get into a dark place, you know, pretty quickly when you think nobody else can understand. But right there, it's, it's so clear. Like Jesus is, sympathizes with our weakness. He understands what we are wrestling through. Like, it's an awesome thing. There's nothing, there is nothing that any of us are going through right now or will ever go through in our lives that, is, that would surprise Jesus, would confuse him, that he wouldn't be able to relate to. He's able to relate. He's able to understand. It says also that Jesus has been tempted just as we are and yet was without sin. So we have one who prays for us, who intercedes on our behalf, that has actually overcome the very same temptations that we are facing. Now, I want to, a lot of times we think, oh, it's Jesus, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, and then we kind of fall back into the weakness thing. No, he sympathizes with your weakness. He's not weirded out by your weakness. He's not surprised that, that we fall and, and, and struggle in the way that we do. He himself can relate to it in a profound way that, I, again, to me, I like embracing mystery more and more and saying, I don't understand how that works, but Jesus, I know that you, I know that you can identify, I know that you've been tempted, and I know that you've overcome. And the thing is, is that the one who's praying for you is the one who has overcome. The one who is, over, who is interceding for you, for your family, for your loved ones, is the one, he is the one who has overcome. And so, I mean, that's, that's an awesome thing. His one is so strong, so powerful, so tremendously able to understand that he is. And the fact that he's able to do that, it comes in and he says, let us then approach God's, uh, God's uh, throne of grace with confidence that we could, we could receive mercy and find grace to help us. Do you, know, uh, do you know that it really, really makes a difference whether or not we, we come before him and ask? There's mercy, there's grace, there's help in time of need. Like Jesus is, is, is coming, but I'm kind of I'm kind of jumping into, into, uh, into my next point, which is simply this. Because, as I said last week, you know, we kind of join Jesus in the role that he has as prophet, like that God not only speaks to us, that Jesus is the God who speaks to us, but he's also the God who speaks through us. So in that sense, we join with Jesus in the prophetic, in the in his role as prophet. We are joining also with Jesus as an intercessor. We join with him. So it's not only that, I mean, you could sort of go, well, if Jesus is praying, then he's got it covered. I don't need to. Like we could just sort of say, well, you know, well, we'll just let Jesus take care of it because he's a lot better, you know. Uh, but no, he actually calls us and invites us into the very activity that he himself is doing. So he is an intercessor He's the one who lives forever to intercede and to pray on our behalf. And he invites us into this. Like there's something so excellent and awesome and noble about the ministry of intercession. And I'm going to discipline myself not to go off on on how awesome the the ministry of intercession is. But we are in a, this is the house of prayer. We're built around the ministry of prayer, the ministry of intercession. And when we do that, which feels so weak to me so often. 
Like, it's just like, oh, God, this is, is this really making a difference? Am I, is, this the, is this the way that I should be spending my time? Is this worthy of what, you know, what I should, maybe I could be doing something different. I want, but then I just, I love thinking about the fact that Jesus is an intercessor who calls us to do the same thing, calls us to join him. Like if you want to do something that Jesus is doing, you, you 100% are in, you're, you're just always going to hit it when you intercede, when you pray for someone else. You're always going to be joining Jesus in something that he's doing. You're always doing something that is worthwhile. You know that Jesus, I mean, this sounds really obvious, but Jesus never wastes time. He doesn't, he doesn't waste time, ever. He's always doing things that are on purpose and things that are meaningful. That doesn't mean he's working all the time. I mean, you know, I think Jesus knew how to, you know, clearly he knew how to turn the water into wine and, and then drink some of the wine and chill out and talk to people and all that stuff. Like that stuff has purpose too. This is why that, that parable is so important, is that it shows us some of those things. But he's, when he's in the, engaged in intercession, when we join him in that, is so awesome and profound. First Peter, uh, First Peter verse two, or chapter 2, it says this, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Okay, just that phrase, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, intercession is one of those ways that we do that, is one of the ways that we offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God when we come in intercession and pray through Jesus. But you are a chosen people. Again, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, again, I just wanted to read the, the verses from 1 Peter because it clearly establishes that you and I are called to, be, uh, to have a priestly role. It's not just sort of the guy who is, who is the priest or wears the collar or is the pastor or the guy who serves communion or whoever it is that you might think of. You and I are called into this priestly ministry. We are all invited into this. Okay? Some people get a, you know, a call to do it in a special way, and, uh, in, a, in a vocational way. That's a different thing. But all of us are called to this. All of us are called, and that's why it's significant that Jesus speaks to us and through us, that that's a profound part with this this prophetic dimension of this, and there's this priestly role. I mean, the nobility of what we've been called into. Lots of us think that our lives are pretty humdrum and boring, and what we do day in and day out, it's a little bit dull, and we wish that there was a little, maybe could be a bit more exciting. I want to, we have been called into a priesthood, God's you know that you are God's chosen people? You're his chosen ones. He's actually picked you. He's picked you by name. He's invited you. He knows everything about you. He's praying for you. He wants the best for you. He calls you into something that is so out, outrageous to think about that God would speak through you and through me. That God would invite us, that, the, that Jesus would invite us to join him in prayer. Something that is so, ex it's so extremely important to him. He lives forever to make intercession. And that we may de like just declare the praises of him who called his people out of darkness and into marvelous light. So, just wrapping this up. Week one, we looked at how God is the God who sees us that we are not hidden. We talked about the fact that God is the God who sees you and he sees me and he sees us and the prof the, just the profound reality of the, uh, that he's the one who sees us. Not only is he the one who sees us, he's the one who speaks to us, as I've said many times already. We looked at this last week, that he speaks to us. So he sees us and he, he sees us, he speaks to us, and this week we're looking at the fact that he, he calls us to join him in this ministry of intercession. That he, that he himself intercedes. He intercedes for us. Sees us, he speaks to us, and he intercedes for us on our behalf. 
and invites us into that, into that, into that reality. Again, I, I mentioned this verse earlier from Hebrews, that we might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. That we, because we have this sure and steady anchor for the soul, Jesus is the one who sees you. He is the one and the hope of that, that he sees you, that he speaks to you, and that he prays for you. And so if there's one thing that I'd like you to to take tonight, it's the reality that God is praying for you, that Jesus, fully God, fully man, that he's actually praying for you. Because I, I know that this is a very, very difficult time for all of us. We've been saying this, you know, week in and week out, that these are challenging times. And as we seek to take hope out of the drawer, as we seek to embrace hope again, a true and living hope in Jesus, we look to Jesus and we recognize, tonight we recognize that he is interceding for us. And just the significance, the significance of that. I'm just going to pray and, and then we'll, we'll continue on. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight that you are the God. You see us in this place, like right in this room. Holy Spirit, you are here. We, we honor your presence as the Holy One. We, we do, we honor your presence. And, and Jesus, as we, we now begin to move towards your table, we move towards your invitation to come to your table, to be with you, we say yes. We would dare to be those that would embrace hope again. We would be those that would say yes, Lord. Yes, God, again, I would dare to believe again, and I would dare to hope again in you, Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that in these moments that you would be speaking, that it would go deeper than the mind, that it would actually penetrate our soul. You have given us this anchor for our souls. Would you touch our souls and bring life again? Would you reignite hope within us? Hope even for the week ahead. Hope for the holiday that is coming at Christmas. Hope for the new year that is ahead of us still. Lord, come and, and re build and reestablish hope. Holy Spirit, I know that you do this. You, you are the one who, you cause us to overflow with hope. Holy Spirit, you're causing us to overflow and abound with hope. And so for every one of us, Lord, we pray for that increase in hope. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would uh, take your uh, program we're going to say together, uh, we've gone, going to say the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and again, this is something that we are saying as we make this confession, as we say this together, we say, it, uh, we say it to God, but we're also saying it to one another. And we are making this confession that this, this is who we are, this is what we believe. So we will say uh, together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. There he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm turning to the next part, our prayer of confession. I'm just pausing for a second. Yes. Almighty 
and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices, the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are repentant according to your promises that are declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and joyful life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And together, the assurance of forgiveness. Grant to your people, merciful Lord, pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sin and love you with our whole being. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.